In this video, we're going to be discussing the proper way to break in your new or rebuilt diesel engine. Look at those new cylinder packs. Hey guys, Josh with the Adept Tape channel, and in this video, we're going to be discussing proper diesel engine break-in procedure. Now, there's a lot of controversy about this subject, and before I get into the meat of the subject, I wanted to say this advice is not to go in place of whatever your manufacturer's recommendations are. If your manufacturer says, run it lightly or run it really heavy, this advice is not to supersede that. This is just my opinion from my experience, from what I've read and what I've researched, okay? So we're gonna talk about some of the components that are wearing in or are breaking in during the break-in process, how long it should take, and how you should drive the engine or the vehicle that the engine's in during the break-in process, okay? So first thing to do is let's define our break-in process. So what is a break-in process? Well, anytime you have a new or rebuilt engine, you have components that are new to the engine. These are going to be piston rings, pistons, you could have a new camshaft, lifters, push rods, rocker arms, bearings, that while the engine is first running, if there are parts that are not mated properly or don't match up exactly yet, they're going to wear against each other. And some of this wear is normal, and some of it is unwanted, obviously, but... What we're mostly going to be talking about here is the normal wear that needs to occur for these parts to last a very long time. So that's your break-in process. And typically this is going to be the first several hours, a couple hundred miles, maybe a few thousand miles on the machine or engine. And this is the most critical portion of the engine life. While the break-in is taking place, if the break-in procedure is not performed correctly, it can cause shorten engine life, higher blow-by, possibly worn components earlier than they should wear out or worn components when they shouldn't wear out. So let's get into some of the individual components and what's happening during the break-in process. And then after that, we're going to talk about how I suggest and how many manufacturers suggest breaking in an engine. So the first part of the break-in process and the component we're going to be discussing are your bearings. All engines have them, and they're not like a roller bearing or a ball bearing. Engine bearings are typically small, machined, soft metal items that are inserted between moving metal parts. Crankshaft, a connecting rod, a camshaft, and they have an oil film, or typically during the rebuild process, they'll have a grease film that will be replaced by an oil film a few seconds after running. And the point of the oil film is to actually keep the rotating part from non-rotating parts. So the connecting rod would be protected from the crankshaft with the bearing. And they really are not wearing in. There should be no contact actually between the two rotating parts because there should be a spot fairly thick oil film a few thousands thick that will prevent the parts from contacting each other so you're not really wearing in or breaking in the bearings if you have the wrong size bearings or something's defective about the bearing or the part the break-in process isn't really going to fix that if it's going to spin or damage something it's going to do that no matter what you do so you can see this bearing has some light damage to it this is a used bearing um, this has several hundred thousand miles on this bearing the break-in process doesn't really affect bearings if you have good oil pressure your bearings should be fine there's really no break-in process for them so the next component that can really vary on the break-in process is your camshaft and the lifters now most older engines and some newer engines use what they call flat tappet camshaft and lifters and these are basically a metal to metal flat face where the cam lobe as it rotates over the lifter sits on it and it helps push your push rod or move your rocker arm these have very specific break-in procedures you will want to follow the camshaft or the oem's recommendation for breaking in your camshaft on a flat tappet this could be solid or hydraulic flat tappet and these typically you're going to run them at higher rpms for 15 to 20 minutes and what that's doing is the lifter is seating and mating against the surface of the camshaft and 
This is extremely important that you do this on a flat tappet. Now, most newer engines are gonna have something they call a roller cam and a roller valve train. This would be a roller lifter. And this is a cat one. And a roller lifter, it wears against the cam face, but not the same way that a flat tappet does because it has a roller. So there's really no friction between the lifter and the camshaft. The, as the cam lobe moves, it rolls, and there's an oil film on it. So there's really no wear. Uh, this roller lifter had several hundred thousand miles on it, and it's still in very good working order. It has some small fretting that's just from wear over the life of the engine. That's fairly normal. You can also see this was a pushrod engine. There's not much break-in for the push rods. They will wear against the cups uh, wherever they sit and then against the rocker arms. But as long as they have good oil feed, not much to do on a roller valve train. Okay, so the biggest and most controversial portion of the break-in procedure is the cylinders. And not just the cylinders themselves, but the items that contact the cylinders. And what those are is your piston and your piston rings. Now this is a 3208 cat piston, but most pistons are all about the same, um, other than just the size of them. And this is a two ring piston, as you can see. You have one compression ring, one oil control ring. Most newer engines are gonna have two compression rings and one oil control ring. Now, this is the part where your break-in procedure is very important. And the reason for this is it can be load dependent. Now, what do I mean by load dependent? I don't mean RPM dependent, although varying the RPMs is a good idea. What I mean by load dependent is in a diesel engine, diesel engines are made to have handle very, very high cylinder pressures, much higher than a gas engine. And there's two reasons for this. One is they have a much higher compression ratio. So the amount of air between the top and the bottom of the stroke in the cylinder is typically a lot more than a gas engine. Also, most diesels are turbocharged. So you're not only compressing a lot more volume, you're forcing air in, which is artificially increasing cylinder pressures, either by use of a supercharger or more typically a turbocharger. And the reason that the load is important during the break-in process is your piston rings. So when you have a light load, you're forcing air against the top of the piston, but also some air is getting past the piston and getting on top of and behind the piston ring. And piston rings are not square. They are more of a keystone. They're kind of tapered. You can kind of see them. So when you force air on top of the ring, it's also gonna get behind it into the ring land. And as the pressure increases, it's gonna force the piston against the cylinder wall. So as this piston ring is forced against the cylinder wall, what's gonna happen is the ring is going to wear against the cylinder wall. And this is very important. If not enough load is applied during the break-in process on your diesel engine, the piston ring and the cylinder wall will not wear in properly against each other. And this can cause a lot of things. This can cause glazing, which is very bad. It can cause crosshatch damage. It can cause very early wear to your cylinders, which will result in high oil consumption and high blow-by, which are basically your engine's gonna have artificial wear and it's gonna act like an older engine, even though it's newer, because your piston rings were not seated properly against the cylinder walls. Okay, so now that we've discussed the critical engine components and what's happening during the break-in process, what is the proper way to break in your engine? Well, this is kind of a subjective question because manufacturers are gonna differ exactly on what their break-in procedure is. In fact, it's very hard to find from CAT even what exactly is the best way to break in an engine, but from my experience, you want to load it early and you need to keep it loaded, especially before the first oil change. Now, what do I mean by loaded? You don't want to just idle it for 20 minutes after a fresh rebuild or a new engine or a reman engine. And then after that, rev it up for 15 minutes and let it run around 1500 RPM. And then you get a flat trailer and you drive on flat ground for 2000 miles. That will probably result in very, very poor piston ring seating against the cylinder walls and could possibly cause glazing, 
high oil consumption, high blow-by early in the life of this engine. So the best thing to do, in my opinion, and from the literature I've read, is you don't want to idle it very long at all. You want to start the engine up, make sure it has good oil pressure, make sure you don't have any bad leaks, no engine noise that's unusual, no weak cylinders, no weird sounds, squeaks, knocks. Once it has idled a couple, you know, a couple minutes basically, and all those things check off and you don't have any check engine lights, you want to put it under a load almost immediately. You don't want to do it while the engine's still cold though. So the best thing to do is we put it on the dyno right away. And what I'll do is drive it out of the dyno, turn the engine off, set up the dyno, get it running, and then I'll immediately put a small load on it to get the engine temperature up quicker. So this will probably be about 25% engine load while the engine's between, you know, about 120 degrees up to about 160 degrees. Once it's about 160 degrees, your cylinder temperatures have increased, the coolant temperature is starting to get a lot hotter. Then I'll start loading it higher and higher. I might go to 40%. Now, 40% is going to take it up to normal operating temperature rather quickly. Now, this is all within the first couple minutes of this engine being started, remember? So, assuming no leaks, no codes, no weird noises, uh, once it reaches operating temperature, I put it at full load. And I do it at four different intervals of RPM. So I'll typically do 1200, 1400, 1600, and 1800 RPM full load pull. So this is foot to the floor, dyno at 100%. And I'll do this until the temperature of the cylinders, well, the coolant temperature basically, has reached the point. So what putting it at these high loads is going to do, and at these RPMs of 1200, 1400, 1600, 1800, it's going to increase your coolant temperature very quickly. It's also going to get maximum cylinder pressures in the engine. So this is going to help seat those rings against the cylinder walls immediately. And I'll hold the loads there until the, the coolant temperature is starting to climb up. And once it gets to about 210, because you can overheat an engine very quickly on a dyno, I'll usually pull the load back down and then I'll go to the next RPM set point. After it has made all these pulls and the performance of the engine is acceptable, it's making good torque, horsepower, boost, then I'll typically hold it at the heaviest load the engine will take without increasing in coolant temperature. So as long as it's around the 200 degree mark, you know, normal operating temperature, I'll hold it at whatever the ambient temperature will allow the engine to run at without overheating. So I'll try to keep it in the 200 to 205 degree range and I'll run it at, it might be, you know, if it's 100 degrees outside or 80 or 60, I'll hold it at maybe 60, 70, 80% load on the engine for about a half an hour to an hour. While varying the RPMs, you know, you want to move it throughout its normal operating range and whatever engine you're working on, that operating range will change on the RPM. So I'll typically go from, you know, most people don't run theirs around 1200 RPM, but it makes max torque at that point. So I'll run it between 12 and 1800 RPMs, varying the load and the RPMs for about that hour, making sure you don't lose oil pressure or the coolant temperature is not exceeding an overheat. And that is really helping to seat those rings. At this point, the engine is now broken in as far as the dyno period goes, now it's time to tell the customer the proper way to run the engine, at least for the first oil change. So what the customer should know, or the driver should know on a new engine, even after it's been dynoed, is this engine is still breaking in. You do not want to idle this engine for very long extended periods of time. You don't want to run it under light loads at higher RPMs, let's say if he's running a PTO, don't let the PTO just run all day if you're out of the truck. That can damage the piston rings seating against the cylinder walls. So what you'll want to do, typically these are on highway trucks, so I'll tell them, you know, hopefully have a load right away. We'll give them the truck. I'll say, you know, hey, you want to run this for as heavy a load as you can so you know obviously don't run without a trailer you want to have a trailer with hopefully a load and then run it you know as hard as you can really don't abuse it but you want to keep it at varying slightly rpms heavily loaded and especially for the first oil change now your first oil change should be briefer than the normal oil changes most people seem to change your oil about every 10,000 on on highway truck 
I'd say about cut that in half. So you probably want to go about 5,000 miles before the first oil change and try to keep it heavily loaded for that period of time. And the reason you want to make your oil change briefer is you're going to have slightly higher, well, you're going to have definitely higher than normal uh, metal in the oil, and your oil filter is going to be holding more metal after the break-in process because not all parts are perfectly machined. So you're going to have higher metal from them wearing against each other after the dyno and the break-in period. So you want to get your oil filter and your oil change sooner. And then after that first oil change, you're okay to go. You know, your normal 10,000 or 12,000, whatever your oil change interval is. Now what about running some sort of break-in additive or a break-in oil? If you're running a flap tap it, there might be some sort of additive that they want you to add to your engine oil. And especially the cam lobes and the lifters themselves will be coated with a special type of lubricant to help them seat against each other's face. But in general, if you're running a roller valve train design and you have a high quality oil, you don't typically have to run any sort of additive to make the oil extra thick or extra slick or anything like that. Unless, of course, there is a specific manufacturer recommendation for any sort of additive. The same goes with your fuel system and your coolant. There's really no special additives you need to run on an engine that's breaking in. And that's really all I have for the break-in process. I hope this sheds some light on the subject, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you. In this week's Destruction of the Week, we have what appears to be not very bad destruction, but it still caused the truck to be down overnight and to be towed and a load to go undelivered. So these two C-15 injectors had recently been resealed. All six had been resealed, actually. And what had happened is, as you can see, the one on the left, the bottom O-ring had not been installed. It had either fallen off or something happened to it. It didn't make it in the bore. And what happens is that bottom seal is supposed to keep the compression from getting past and into the center seal, which keeps the fuel in the head. When that seal failed, the bottom one, or was not installed, it wipes out the center one, which caused the fuel rail in the head to dump into the cylinder. This caused a loss of fuel pressure and the cylinder to fill with fuel, which caused the cylinder to hydraulic, luckily was not damaged. But still, even a single O-ring can cost an engine to not run. All right, hope you enjoy it.